Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today I have with me Dr. Jim Mazzara. Dr. Mazzara is an orthopedic surgeon who did his medical school training at New York Medical College. From there, he completed an orthopedic residency at St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital, an affiliated hospital of Columbia University. Good morning, Dr. Mazzara. Good morning. How are you? Today, what I would like to discuss is a, a relatively common problem of the shoulder, rotator cuff disease. Yes. Uh, patients hear this term constantly, and I think what I'd like to do is try to clarify, one, what is this problem with the rotator cuff, a little bit about what is the rotator cuff, and then what are our options for treating. So if you could start out by just, just clarifying this whole concept of what the rotator cuff is. Okay. Well, the rot rotator cuff is actually a set of uh, four muscles and tendons that help us stabilize and move the shoulder. The mus muscular part of the rotator cuff actually starts on the back of the shoulder blade, and as it goes out to the shoulder, it converts and changes from muscle to tendon. Those four tendons then blend together as a cuff and attach to the upper part of the, the bone called the humerus. Mm -hmm. The rotator cuff functions in a number of different ways. It actually functions to stabilize the shoulder joint, keeping the center of the head of the humerus in the center of the socket. In addition to that, while it's working with the muscle called the deltoid muscle, it serves to elevate and rotate and move the shoulder. Mm -hmm. So the rotator cuff is actually a set of muscles and tendons, and the cuff part is what we could consider the tendinous part of the rotator cuff. That part is the part that gets patients into most trouble. The muscular part is actually attached to the tendons and helps moves and stabilize move and stabilize the shoulder. Now when we talk about the whole concept of rotator cuff disease, you yes. know, it goes by lots of different names, impingement, uh, yep. there's rotator cuff tears, there's all sorts of different ways we refer to this. Can you describe for me a little bit so that patients can understand how these conditions happen and just sort of what happens in that continuum of problems that we call rotator cuff disease? Well, the, the rotator cuff uh, can get into trouble as we get a little bit older, as we become more active, or sometimes as we just stress the shoulder. Uh, we see rotator cuff trouble in young athletes. Mm -hmm. uh, those are usually athletes who are doing very strenuous kinds of activ activity. Baseball pitches, for example, and weight trainers can typically stress and strain and create partial tears in the rotator cuff. As we get a little bit older, however, just the normal wear and tear changes that we all go through cause secondary changes in the rotator cuff. There's a certain area in the rotator cuff where there's not a great deal of circulation. That tends to be a, a zone of the rotator cuff in the front of the shoulder, just as it attaches to the bone, which is at risk. And that little area at risk has a very poor circulation, causing any stress and strain to cause little microscopic tears in the tendon. And as those microscopic tears progress and worsen over time, sometimes patients will develop symptoms as it relates to that. Mm -hmm. So a partial tear can end up developing into a full tear and full tears, a full perforation through the tendon can actually progress and will progress over time. Mm -hmm. Now there's a couple of terms that I, I want to make sure that patients hear because they're going to hear them from their, their physicians and other folks. And one is, is the, the concept of tendonitis, yes. the concept of tendinosis, which I think more and more surgeons have a tendency to use for these problems rather than tendonitis. Okay. And then the whole concept of bursitis. You know, I think right. everybody with shoulder pain thinks they have bursitis. True. Clarify those three terms for me. Well, well, there's a technical difference, but as physicians and orthopedic surgeons, we can tend to blend those things together. And so somebody may come in and, and think they have a, t a bursitis. Technically, the bursa is a separate structure. It's a sac-like structure that sits between the rotator cuff and the bone and a little ligament on top of the rotator cuff. And it ser actually serves to lubricate and facilitate motion between the bone and the rotator cuff. If that structure alone becomes inflamed, you'll have a bursitis. Mm. The problem is very often we see patients in the office who don't have an isolated bursitis. They have a little bit of inflammation of the tendon. Technically, we'd call that a tendonitis, even though in the office when I examine patients, I tend to use those words interchangeably. I, I prefer the word tendonitis because I think there's more tendon pathology than pure bursa pathology. Younger patients may get a bursitis. As we get a little bit older in our 30s and 40s, we may get a little bit more of involvement of the rotator cuff tendons, and then you have a tendonitis. There's an inflammatory reaction in the tendon that causes the pain. Inflammation is what causes the pain in many cases. The term tendinosis, however, is a little bit different. You can have a tendinosis and really not have a lot of pain. 
tendinosis, tendinosis is more of a wear and tear phenomenon in the tendon itself. It's these little partial microscopic internal tears in the tendon which may or may not cause any problem for you. We may see it on an MRI. We can do an MRI on a patient and find tendinosis or tendinopathy, for example, and that patient may or may not have any symptoms from that, but it's evidence of wear and tear. And it's, it's for better or for worse, part of life. It's what we all go through. Mm -hmm. Now, one other term that I want to add to the, to the mix, and, and in some ways we consider this a, a little different disease process, but it's all part of the continuum, and that's this concept of impingement in the shoulder. Can you describe to me the concept of impingement and how that may create these things like bursitis, tendinosis, tendinitis? Impingement is actually, it's more of a clinical term, a clinical presentation. It's more of a syndrome and it's associated with bursitis, tendinitis, or tendinosis. And it's, it's actually when the rotator cuff may rub against the structures that sit on top of the rotator cuff. The structures that sit on top of the rotator cuff are the acromion, which is a a, either a flat or a slightly curved shaped bone which is attached to a ligament called the coracochromial ligament that in turn creates an arch over the top of the rotator cuff. Mm -hmm. well, that arch is very important for function but at the same time as that little space or interval between the arch and the rotator cuff becomes crowded you'll get impingement. So it's more of a clinical presentation so patients who may come in with shoulder pain can have terms thrown at them like tendonitis bursitis, impingement, they all really mean the same thing, which is there's not enough space between the bone and the tendon. That tendon is then inflamed or painful, and there may be friction between those two structures. Mm -hmm. And that friction is, is in part what causes the pain, but it can also crowd and impair the space available for the cuff underneath, causing damage to the cuff. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we talked a little bit about what all these things mean. Let's, let's move on and talk a little bit about what causes these. I mean, is, is this um, something that is genetic in, in origin? Is it something that comes from an injury? Or is this something we're all going to get as we age? Is it a condition of aging, so to speak? Well, the, the answer is there's probably a little bit of all of that involved. But I think more of this, more of impingement and tendinopathy or tendinitis, is either activity-induced, you're doing something that's aggravating the rotator cuff, and it's much more common as we get a little bit older. In younger patients, it's probably not as much age-related because those are people in their, in their teens and 20s and 30s, it's more activity related. So they're doing something that's stressing and straining the cuff. Those younger patients may have a tendinitis without actually having impingement though. They may not actually be having any bone spurs or any thickening of the ligament pushing on the tendon creating a problem for them. So it depends on the individual patient. Uh, people who, younger patients who have instability for example, may have extra motion or extra laxity of the joint, those people can have a secondary tendonitis of the shoulder. Mm -hmm. And those younger patients, very common in teens, 20s, and 30s, may actually need to be treated for that instability by stabilizing the shoulder, either through exercise or surgery, as opposed to addressing the tendonitis, because the tendonitis ends up being secondary mm -hmm. to that instability. And the other thing that, in my experience, has been a real problem for people, uh, for example, uh, if, if you're a muffler guy, I sort of I sort of think you're at higher risk. Anybody that works day to day overhead Absolutely. tends to have a problem, and that, and that includes swimmers. I mean, yes. the younger people it includes the throwing athlete, and yep. includes anybody who tends to, like I say, if you're if you conceive of yourself as the muffler guy working right. overhead constantly, I think those folks get that impingement a little earlier than than the normal person. I, w I would agree with that. I, I, I see a lot of working patients who come in who are electricians and plumbers and carpenters and do a lot of overhead work. Uh, it's, uh, for some reason, very common in people who paint and do uh, mm -hmm. a lot of painting overhead as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, those are people who are very frequently self-employed and need to get better fast and get back to their work. Mm -hmm. The other thing I think that, that tends to, to, to happen, and people hear about all the time, is, is that uh, this concept of bone spurs. You know, there's bone spurs in the shoulder causing impingement. Can you explain a little bit of, of the role of that degenerative change, both in the joint above the shoulder, the AC joint, and just in that, uh, what we call the coracoacromial ligament, where you get that bone spur that some people perceive is, is part of the problem? Yeah, the, the acromion is, is the bone that sits on top of the rotator cuff and it's attached to a ligament. Uh, anatomically and genetically, it, it comes in a variety of sizes and shapes. Uh, as we age, however, we may develop bone spurs or little calcium growths on the end of the normal bone. 
that can grow into the area of the ligament and that bone spur that grows into the area of the ligament can actually steal space available for the rotator cuff. Mm -hmm. So it grows into the region where the rotator cuff lives and functions and as a result crowds the rotator cuff causing pressure on it. It, it can also impair the circulation to the cuff as it attaches. And so many of the rotator cuff tears that we see aren't actually on the top surface of the rotator cuff tendon, they're on the bottom surface or on the articular surface as we would say and we can see them from inside the shoulder joint well the the idea is if that the bone spurs on one side of the tendon but the first part of the tear appears on the other side of the tendon is that bone spur really cutting into or or damaging the rotator cuff indirectly it is because it can impair the circulation cause abnormal forces on the tendon and cause this tear in addition to that as we age we just stress and strain our muscles and tendons we're not, we're not designed to be built to last forever, and we just go through a normal wear and tear process. And as I mentioned initially, there's a circulatory area, a cir area of circulation where the cuff attaches to the bone. That watershed area has very poor circulation, and so as we get older, the stresses and strains of normal daily life will cause microscopic tears of the inner fibers on, the, on what we call the articular surface of the tendon on the bottom surface, and those partial tears eventually progress to bigger tears over a period of time. Okay. Now, how does a person, a patient, know when this is occurring? When should they seek care? What symptoms should they be looking for? Well, we, we all experience those wear, wear and tear changes more often than not without knowing it. Uh, it's when people are impaired and they have an ache or a pain that they can't explain and it doesn't go in a week or two that they need to ask themselves, well, why, why am I having this pain? Is this something that is a problem that will go away? And, and many patients will come into the office saying, well, I thought it was going to go away, and it didn't, so here I am. Uh, quite frequently, when pa patients can't do their work, their leisure activities, and especially when they can't sleep at night, they tend to come into the office. Uh, that, and the biggest issue is that they have pain that they perceive in the arm. Now shoulder pain starts up here in the upper part of the rotator cuff in the area of the insertion, insertion or attachment of the rotator cuff, but patients very frequently don't feel it up here, they feel it down here. They feel it in the middle of the arm and sometimes as far as the elbow and even in more advanced cases sometimes down the arm a little bit. As an orthopedist we need to help get the information from the patient, find out when it bothers them and differentiate the, mul the multiple causes for shoulder arm pain. So people may come in and say, I have a deep ache over here, or when I use my arm, I do certain things, or I sleep, I do overhead activity, I have the shoulder pain. Mm. In the initial stages of impingement syndrome or tendonitis of the shoulder, the symptoms may fluctuate. It may wax and wane over a period of time. You may have a, a good week, and you may be able to do all of your physical activity, but the following week you might have increased pain and discomfort in the shoulder, and so you tend to use it less. Over a period of time, there's that pattern that we see associated with the previous activity. That's the first initial phase of what we would call impingement syndrome or tendonitis of the shoulder. Eventually, you get to the point where the pain never actually goes away. There's always a certain level of pain there. It gets better and worse, but it never quite goes away. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, you, you mentioned the pain in the midarm. And, and in my experience, I've had patients come in and they'll just, they're just convinced that the problem is yep. in their arm and you can't convince them Ab it's in absolutely. their shoulder. Absolutely. And, and the other side is that I see a lot of patients who have pain that radiates into the sub, or the supraspinatus muscle and up into the shoulder blade. And they, they wonder if it's not coming from their neck and they may start getting a little neck pain. I, I think that's very important. You can have shoulder pain that refers back. Mm. But when you have patients who come in who report pain on the top of the shoulder or in the upper part of the back, you have to pay a lot of attention to the cervical spine. You have to examine their neck and make sure they don't have arthritis of the neck, referring symptoms to the upper part of the shoulder. You also have to examine the, the other very important part of the shoulder, which is their acromioclavicular joint. Mm -hmm. Patients will frequently have a little bit of arthritis up here where the clavicle attaches to the acromion. There's a very small joint there. It's about the size of uh, a couple of nickels stacked together. And, and those, that little tiny joint, as it becomes arthritic and wears out, develops bone spurs as well. Mm -hmm. So those bone spurs are significant contributing factors to impingement as well. It's not just that bone spur that grows into the ligament on the acromion. Mm -hmm. It's the bone spur from the arthritis in the AC joint that puts pressure on the rotator cuff underneath. Mm -hmm. Now, underneath that bone spur is where the rotator cuff lives and functions. The less space there is for the cuff, 
the more trouble your cuff's going to have doing what you want it to do. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the other thing I'd, I'd like to bring out and, and, and see if this is in your experience. One of my, my uh, um, sort of things that I ask patients is uh, when they sleep. They get mm -hmm. pain, especially if they sleep with that arm yep. up like this. So they'll, they'll wake up in the middle of the night and that shoulder will just be aching because absolutely. they're in that impingement position. That's, that's absolutely true. And as I mentioned, though, that's when people come into the office. They could put up, with it, put up with it when they were at work or when they're out on their leisure activities, but when they can't sleep, mm -hmm. it makes for a very unhappy patient. Mm -hmm. and they, they come in. So when that patient presents themselves to your office, how do you go about trying to make this diagnosis? Is this a clinical diagnosis that you feel like all you need is a good history and physical? Do you do any radiological imaging? How do you proceed with a patient like that? You always have to start with a good history and physical. Uh, you'll, you always have to ask patients, uh, do you have activities that bother you? When does it bother you? How long does it bother you? Was there a sudden event? Is there a sudden event that, that caused this to occur? Uh, in that sudden event, was there a rip or a tear? Did, did something else happen? Or is it just kind of a slow, gradual onset of symptoms? In addition, you want to know if they've had any treatment. And you also want to ask them if they have any numbness or tingling mm -hmm. in the upper extremity. You want to make sure that you're not assigning shoulder pain to the rotator cuff when, in fact, it might be coming from something else. So thinking about all the other contributing factors to shoulder pain uh, is an important part of the evaluation. And then we examine the patient. After we've taken a good history and we want to know what treatment, the, the treatment they've had, we want to examine the patient. We want to look at the position of the shoulder. We want to see if there's atrophy or asymmetry compared to one side. Uh, do they have an obvious bone spur? Do they have something that's clear and, and you can see visibly? Then you do a physical examination. On your physical examination, you want to ask them to range their shoulder throughout a full range of motion. Many patients can do that, and some patients can't. Those who can't may have another contributing cause to their shoulder pain. Other common causes to shoulder pain are things like frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis or arthritis of the shoulder. Do they have a lot of weakness in the shoulder? And do they have normal neurologic exam of the shoulder? Can they move their hand and wrist? Uh, do they have normal reflexes in the upper extremity? Once you've done a very thorough physical examination, you're somehow convinced that this is either rotator cuff disease uh, or arthritis or frozen shoulder. You have to do a properly set of a proper set of x-rays and a standard set of x-rays is not always appropriate. There are very particular views that orthopedic surgeons like to get. We like to see a, a clear shot through the glenohumeral joint, through the shoulder joint. We like to position the shoulder in such a way where we can see if there's a bone spur, we can see if there's arthritis, and if there's arthritis, how much. And doing those x-rays by the orthopedist is, is actually very important because we, we typically position you in a certain way that, let's say, you're radiologist or medical doctor may not order these very specialized views. And once we've done that, then we can come back to the patient even before we do an MRI and say, this is your history, this is what I think your diagnosis is, and these are your options. We always lay out all of our options for the patient from the simplest thing to the most complicated. And at the end of all that, may make a recommendation. And my own personal philosophy is I'd like to do the simplest thing that works and discuss with the patient and get some idea from them how they feel about that. Now when do you move on to getting an MRI scan? What, what triggers you to go from those x-rays to saying I need some more information, I'm concerned about other okay. things, and what other tests are you going to do at that point? Well it, it's going to depend on the, the patient's history. If a patient comes in with a slow gradual onset of shoulder pain and I think they have a, an impingement syndrome or tendonitis and they have not had any treatment, we need to start some conservative treatment. We need to start with activity modification. We need to start with an anti-inflammatory. There are a number of different anti-inflammatories that are available. Some are prescriptions, some are over the counter. And then we also talk about corticosteroid injections, which can be very helpful and sometimes uh, very give patients a dramatic degree of improvement initially. But anti-inflammatories or cortisone shot are not generally going to be the cure. Mm. They are part of a solution, and the other part of the solution, very importantly, is going to be physical therapy. In many cases, patients can do therapy on their own. In many patients, they can't. They need the supervision of a therapist. So we might recommend therapy for a number of weeks. Uh, we might recommend therapy for three or four weeks in a reevaluation to assess how they've done with therapy, how they do with either the shot or the anti-inflammatory. 
and discuss with them whether or not they think more conservative treatment is going to be beneficial. If somebody comes back four weeks later and has absolutely no improvement in their shoulder pain, I kind of have to wonder, well, why aren't they getting better? Is there something more serious in there? And I might opt for an earlier MRI than if somebody's coming along and getting better every few weeks or so with therapy and home exercise, I might be more inclined to wait two or three months before doing an MRI. So it's not a knee-jerk reaction for you as an orthopedist to get an MRI scan necessarily on that first visit for shoulder pain? Not if the patient has a slow and gradual onset of symptoms. On the other hand, if somebody comes in and says, you know, on Thursday my shoulder was fine, on Friday I had an injury and now I have pain, I can't lift my arm, that's an immediate indication to me that they've had some kind of an acute injury. I would be much more inclined to do an MRI in that patient if they have findings that I think suggest a tendon injury to the rotator cuff, possibly a tear. Mm. Because under those circumstances, I would like to let that patient know that if they have a tear, they have some other options available. And again, that would depend on the individual patient uh, and how old they are and what their functional capacity is. Yeah, and I think we ought to also mention that, that at some, you mentioned the whole concept of pain being referred from other places like the neck. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, again, we as orthopedists look at that patient and say, you know, I'm really suspicious this has nothing to do with your shoulder. And all of a sudden, we've gone from a patient complaining of shoulder pain to saying, mm -hmm. I want to get some x-rays of your neck and an MRI scan of your neck. Absolutely. And they're mm -hmm. saying, what are you talking about? Um, so I think patients need to know that sometimes we go off on a different area True. looking because we're suspecting that the problem is not where it's presenting. Well, that's going to be based on our history and exam. Right. And quite honestly, it can be very difficult initially to differentiate some of those patients. And I've seen quite a few patients who have a combination of both. Mm -hmm. They have a bit of neck arthritis and a little irritated nerve in the neck causing some upper extremity pain. And they also have some rotator cuff disease. And we also see patients who come in who may have a rotator cuff we think they have a rotator cuff problem when in fact the weakness in the shoulder is actually nerve related. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had uh, multiple patients come in with uh, pinched nerves in the neck or even injuries to the, with the set of nerves that comes out of your spine going to your shoulder called the brachial plexus where they come in with profound weakness and we do an evaluation of the rotator cuff in the neck and sometimes nerve conduction testing is an important part of evaluating shoulder weakness that's something that we don't necessarily do initially. It's going to be based on the patient's history and their physical findings and what our clinical impression is. If clinically I'm, I, I think it's a nerve problem, well, we will, we will direct evaluation to the cervical spine, either with an MRI of the neck or an EMG. But if I'm convinced in, from history or exam that it's the shoulder, I, we tend to focus on the x-rays of the shoulder initially and then later on an MRI. Patients who may be unable to have an MRI of the shoulder for whatever reason, some patients who have pacemakers, can't have MRIs, can have a CAT scan arthrogram. And that's another very good way to evaluate for a rotator cuff problem. It doesn't give us quite as much information as an MRI would. But for patients who are unable to have an MRI of the shoulder, a CAT scan arthrogram is a very good way to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, and you've, you've mentioned treatment to some degree. When that patient presents, as long as they don't have something that you think is a serious injury, such as a, an acute rotator cuff tear mm -hmm. that needs to be dealt with immediately, you mentioned sort of that conservative treatment, then moving on to more invasive treatments, such as an injection, uh, and you've mentioned physical therapy. Lay that out for me in terms of what your ideal path for a patient who has you know, impingement rotator cuff disease probably doesn't have a rotator cuff tear. Okay. Um, lay out a plan of what the patient should expect in terms of treatment and when you make choices such as when do I do an injection, when do I uh, uh, stop these things and say they're not working and move on to surgery. Uh, I think initially I will always have that discussion with the patient about either oral anti-inflammatories or a cortisone shot. There's, there's risk to taking oral anti-inflammatories just as is risk to anything else. When you kind of look at the risk and the benefit of oral medication versus a cortisone shot, I think it's if you think somebody doesn't have a cuff tear, a cortisone shot is a little bit safer and easier. The problem is patients very frequently don't want to have needles. And I respect that and that's okay. And then the other option is oral, oral anti-inflammatory. You wor worry about the side effects and heartburn and GI problems with oral anti-inflammatories and even interactions with other medications. 
But that's part of the solution. The other part of the solution is going to be physical therapy. Physical therapy is going to be designed to stretch the tighter areas of the rotator cuff to get the shoulder motion back to as close to normal as possible and then strengthen the weakened portions of the rotator cuff with the therapist. Most patients can do that with the therapist. Some patients can do that at home. I do recommend home exercise program when necessary, but I think people do better with therapy. I'll generally see that patient three or four weeks later and evaluate how they've done. If somebody says, well, I'm 50% better, I think that you can reasonably and safely continue conservative treatment. They can eventually taper the anti-inflammatories if, if they're on that, and then you see them a month later. And again, each time you evaluate those people, what we're trying to figure out is, are we making them better? Has the treatment we've rec we've recommended improved their symptoms to the point where they notice a, an improvement compared the, to where they were initially. If the answer is yes, you can continue. If somebody wants to check in every month or two just to make sure that they're doing okay and they eventually get back to normal, they don't need to have an MRI of the shoulder. Those people who at six or eight or 12 weeks of conservative treatment aren't really getting better and I don't think they have a tear, but they do have impingement, I'd probably recommend they have an MRI. If they have normal motion of their shoulder and they don't have a frozen shoulder and they don't have impingement, I think we need to go ahead and get more information to find out why they're not getting better. There's gotta be some reason. And in many of those cases, we'll see a very large bone spur related to the uh, bone spur in the acromion or related to acromioclavicular osteoarthritis that's pushing on and squeezing and sometimes even indenting the rotator cuff on the MRI. And in many of those cases, we might recommend other options available to those, to those patients, such as arthroscopic surgery. Mm -hmm. Now, I wanna, I wanna go back to physical therapy for a moment because okay. I think a lot of people don't understand what we're trying to achieve when we send a patient to physical therapy. And you, you've, you said two very important things. You said, one, to regain full range of motion of the shoulder, right. and two, the, the strengthening of the rotator cuff muscles. Tell us why that's important. Uh, if, the, if the shoulder is not fully flexible and you don't have all of your motion, your rotator cuff is not gonna move normally. The center of the head of the humerus is not gonna remain in the center of the glenoid. The head is not gonna be in the center of the socket. As a consequence, what will happen is you'll get this eccentric motion of the shoulder. As a result of that, you will get increased friction between the tendon and the bone, or the tendon and the ligament, or that arch overhead that we've referred to earlier. You, so you have to get all of your motion back. In addition to that, if your rotator cuff is weak, you'll again, you won't get normal function and normal motion of your shoulder, and you'll get this abnormal mechanics of the shoulder joint, and that will cause increased friction and increased pain. If you can recover all of your motion and get your strength back, the shoulder works better. It's, it's back in balance, for example. What, people sometimes describe the rotator cuff as trying to keep the ball and socket joint of the shoulder in balance. When it's too tight in one area or too weak in another, it's out of balance. And like any machine, your joint will not function properly and the parts will be under increased stress and friction. And as a consequence of that, as a consequence of that you'll have the pain in the shoulder. So you have to focus on stretching and eventually strengthening. Stretching is always primary. You want to get your motion back before you start pulling on elastic bands or lifting a free weight or doing an isometric exercise. Because, because if you strengthen an otherwise painful shoulder, you're going to end up aggravating it. And people who go to therapy and find out that therapy aggravates the shoulder pain may not be addressing the true pathology there. And so the therapist needs to identify that. That's one of the dangers of sending people home with exercises that they don't always have the supervision of a therapist a couple of times a week to to clarify for them that, gee, you can't do this exercise if it hurts or you shouldn't do that exercise that way. Or if a certain strengthening exercise becomes painful, there's gotta be another way to do that. And that's the value of seeing a very good, capable, experienced physical therapist. Yeah, I think that's so critical. I think that we just, uh, you know, a lot of people just sort of feel like, well, exercises are exercises, physical therapy is physical therapy, and there's, yeah. there's definitely refinements in no, that mix, and you gotta do it right. Absolutely. And the balance of, of the rotator cuff and the motion is so critical. And, and the other thing I think is, is, as you pointed out, it takes time. This does not happen. You don't go to one visit True. to a physical therapist, get a set of exercises, and three days later you're well. This, this occurs over a period of time. Absolutely. 
But, you know, I, I do understand that people have time constraints, they have work responsibilities, family responsibilities. Uh, it can be very uh, costly for people to go to physical therapy. But there's some value to that. And the value is that maybe we can get you better without having to subject you to an operation. Mm -hmm. Uh, and after surgery, if you ever end up needing surgery, you still have to go to therapy after surgery anyway. Mm. So our goal is to make you better without having to, have to operate on your shoulder. Mm. And many patients can do that quite well. And I think they do it better, faster, and more effectively if they go to therapy. Now, you mentioned cortic corticosteroid injection or cortisone injections. I think we ought to define some parameters for patients because a lot of patients, you know, as you say, they don't want to have a needle stuck in their shoulder. They think that's going to hurt. Mm -hmm. They think that uh, there's all sorts of risks to it. The other thing is, is cortisone has a bad name. I mean, people sure. sort yeah. of think, oh, I, I don't want to do cortisone, and my doctor might have told me I could only have three of these injections in my life. Define your philosophy in terms of the utilization of a corticosteroid injection in the shoulder. When do you make that choice to do the first one? And how many do you do? And over what time period? And what are the risks and the benefits of having those injections? Well, I think the benefit uh, of corticosteroids is that you don't have to take a systemic anti-inflammatory. There are no other systemic interactions. The cortisone goes into the shoulder, it stays, it works locally. The nice thing is it's done during a simple office visit. It's an injection. Any, I never tell patients they don't hurt. Uh, any injection you have may have some pain associated with it. It's generally not as severe as patients think it would be. You don't want to repeatedly use cortisone injections. I try not to do any more than three a year, and quite honestly, it's not three a year every year. If you need an injection now, I try to defer the next one for at least three to four months into the same area. But if you came back in a year or two, you can certainly have another one with no adverse side effects. Not any medication used correctly can be very beneficial. People can always have side effects, but if you look at the side effect profile of a cortisone single injection compared to the potential side effects of oral anti-inflammatories, I think it's, it's safer to have a cortisone shot than it would be to take an oral, oral anti-inflammatory. But uh, again, cortisone does have a bad bad name. Uh, it's unfortunate because it is very effective. Uh, in terms of how many injections over a lifetime, well, we generally think of three injections into a single area over a period of a year. But quite honestly, I, I, I don't do three injections a year in the same area every year. Uh, I think that that becomes a misuse of cortisone. I think if somebody's not getting better with a couple of shots of cortisone, then they need other treatment. There might be rare exceptions to that, and the rare exception might be the senior patient who, for medical reasons or age-related reasons, cannot have surgery. We might break the rule for a cortisone shot if they come back every few months or so and need another cortisone shot. And it's a matter of pain relief and function and comfort for that patient. I might opt to give them a little bit more than that, but for patients who can have other treatment options available, I, I tend not to recommend too many cortisone shots. Mm -hmm just because I think there are too many other options that are excellent that are better for patients. Well, let's talk about some of those options. I think that, that you mentioned the surgical options. In a patient with, with rotator cuff disease, let's sort of discuss some of the generic options available in terms of surgery. You mentioned arthroscopic surgery, yes. but let's, let's look at, the, at the, the whole gamut of potential surgical options for those patients. Where do you start and, and what are they? Well, I, I think if you can look at a patient's history and look back and say, you've had every treatment option offered to you, you've had the shot, you've had the anti-inflammatory, you've modified your activity, you've gone to weeks and weeks of physical therapy, and you're at a point where you're really not that much better, and you have all of your motion in your shoulder, not treating arthritis or frozen shoulder, and you're at that fork in the road, and you can't go back and undo the damage to the rotator cuff, you really don't see the benefit or value of repeating the options you've had, you basically have two choices. And patients always have choices, not always good choices, but two choices nonetheless. One option is you can live with it. If you don't have a rotator cuff tear, it's a matter of dealing with the pain. Some patients may opt to do that, but the other option becomes arthroscopic surgery. And arthroscopic surgery is, is an excellent way to treat rotator cuff impingement syndrome or tendonitis if there's a bone spur that is crowding the space available for the rotator cuff. 
And the way we do that is it's an outpatient procedure, takes an hour or less to do. We do it under a, a, what's called an interscaling block, supplemented by a general anesthesia. Interscaling block is a nerve block given to the neck, anesthetizing the shoulder. And then we put a, several small incisions around the shoulder through which we put small instruments. One's a camera and the other's a little motorized burr. And these are about the diameter of a pencil. And we put these through these tiny incisions into the rotator cuff area, into the joint, and we look at the rotator cuff. We inspect the rotator cuff and the rest of the shoulder. And then we redirect the camera and the instruments to the area where the bone spur is on the top side of the rotator cuff. Once we have done that, we're able to identify the bone spur and any arthritis at the acromioclavicular joint and take that out. We use a little motorized burr. And what we do is we flatten out and smooth out the bone spurs and resect the AC joint, the acromioclavicular joint, to make space for the rotator cuff. If there's any exuberant bursitis in that area, we'll trim that back. If there are any partial tears in the rotator cuff, small partial tears, we'll trim those and not, don't necessarily have to repair those. And what we can do is make space available for the rotator cuff. Now, under those circumstances, postoperatively, since we've not repaired the rotator cuff, I put people in a sling. The day after surgery, they take off the sling. They take the dressing off. They can get in the shower. They can get the incisions wet in the shower, soap and water, and a ba couple of Band-Aids. And they can start using the arm as soon as the nerve block wears off. And that can be within 24 to 48 hours. We generally like to see those people about a week or so after surgery. Many of those patients have at least half, sometimes more than half of their motion. Most of those people will have almost all of their motion by about two to four weeks. Again, there's always some variability. People are different and can tolerate different degrees of pain. So how much motion you get back and over what period of time will vary from one individual to another. What I tell patients uh, is that an average patient at about three months will have about 75 to 80% of their function back and they'll be doing almost everything they need to do at about that point. But it's still about three months and not going to be fully recovered. There's always going to be a few different things that they can't do. It's either I can't do something overhead without having pain the next day or I, I can't pull weeds or I can't throw a ball or I, I can't, still can't sleep with my arm above my head. That full recovery takes about six months from a purely arthroscopic bone spur removal or what we call an acromioplasty. Mm. So full recovery is a little bit longer than three months, but people will come back at about, uh, at about the three-month mark and say, this is great, I feel much better, I'm almost where I need to be, but I did this and it hurt, or I still have a little bit of ache and pain, but they're doing much better at that point. Mm. And, and I, I get that, those benchmarks from having done hundreds and hundreds of shoulder arthroscopies and bone spur removals like this, and you, see, you create this composite average patient in your mind, and so there might be patients who come back at a month or two who are doing exceptionally well, who have no pain, who don't need a lot of therapy, who go back and do all of their activities and are playing golf the next month. There are also those patients who even at three months may take a little bit longer to get better. Some of those patients may risk getting a little stiffness in the shoulder. And so when I say three to six months for almost complete or then full recovery, that's really an average. Mm -hmm. Well, what about that patient who does have a rotator cuff tear? I mean, how is that patient treated differently? And sort of contrast that for me with the patient who doesn't have a full thickness tear of his rotator cuff and you can treat with right. the arthroscopic procedure. Is this still an arthroscopic procedure that you can repair the rotator cuff or does, or, or does this require an open incision? Uh, well, it's going to depend on the ind individual surgeon in many cases. Uh, the if a patient has a partial rotator cuff tear, which really means that the tear is through only about, only a certain percent of the rotator cuff doesn't exceed more than half of the rotator cuff thickness as it attaches to the bone. The rotator cuff attaches to the bone. It's about a centimeter or 1.2 centimeters of attachment of tendon to the bone. If there's a very small tear through maybe a millimeter or two of that rotator cuff, you can really trim that back. The balance of the rotator cuff actually functions pretty well if you remove the bone spurs and decompress the shoulder as well. Over a period of time, that tear may progress, but people don't often need any more rotator cuff surgery after that. We all go through these wear and tear changes, so eventually they may have trouble with it, but over the next several years, generally that's not the case. 
If, however, somebody has a partial tear that exceeds half of the tendon thickness, or even a complete rotator cuff tear, we like to repair that, and, and most of those can be fixed arthroscopically. And arthroscopic repairs is still surgery. So even though we may not be making large incisions on the shoulder, we do make smaller incisions, and we're still repairing the tendon back to the bone. And while we advanced technolo technologically very quickly over the last several years with arthroscopic cuff repair, Mother Nature doesn't recognize those technology changes. It still takes six weeks for the tendon to heal to the bone. It doesn't matter whether you do an open repair, a mini open repair, or an arthroscopic repair, the tendon takes six weeks to heal, regardless of how it's fixed. The advantage of the arthroscopic repair, however, is that it's a little bit less invasive, and we can technologically get an excellent repair, and sometimes even better visualization, and sometimes a better, techno a better technique at repairing these, if it's a small or medium tear. Now, larger tears, we can still fix arthroscopically, uh, and there are some orthopedic surgeons who may really opt for a, a mini open repair under those circumstances. And I think in, in my own hands, it's gonna depend on the pathology. When you're doing the arthroscopic surgery, you have to look at the tendon, and you can have to look at the quality of the tissue and the quality of the bone and the kind of patient you're dealing with. If it's a large tear, the question the surgeon always has to ask themselves is, at the end of this operation, am I, am I going to have the best repair that I can possibly have if I do it arthroscopically? If the answer is the bone is very poor, the tendon is poor, the tear is too large, then there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't make an incision because that patient's not going to be bothered by the size of the skin incision. They're going to be affected by the rotator cuff that may or may not be intact at a later point. And there are a lot of risks to re-tearing rotator cuffs, which maybe we can discuss in a bit, but over a period of time, we recognize that technology is great, but Mother Nature doesn't change or recognize technology, so we can do better things arthroscopically through smaller and smaller incisions, but it still takes six weeks for that tendon to heal, and it's still going to take a long time for that shoulder to rehabilitate. Well, and I think that is a key point. I think you mentioned that you know, at three months, the arthroscopic acromioplasty with an intact rotator cuff, right. that person's pretty much back to normal with a few uh, problems here and there, and at right. six months, they're pretty much forgotten they ever had this problem. Absolutely. Whereas yeah. with a rotator cuff tear, um, that's more like a year before those folks it does fully... It does take a long time. It may not be until six or eight weeks after surgery that we allow active motion. Mm -hmm. So as we talk about healing of the rotator cuff, there's going to be a six-week period of time where there's not going to be any active motion of the shoulder. Active motion of the shoulders and the patient directs the arm to move in there, actively lifting or moving the arm. Passive motion, on the other hand, is when a therapist moves the arm or they do uh, what we call pendulum exercises. And that, you have, to res you have to restrict activity for about six weeks under the circumstances, sometimes a little bit longer. If we're doing some rehabilitation for strengthening, the rehab may not start until eight or 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. And it's gonna depend on the patient and the tear and the rep quality rep of the repair which is indirectly a function of the tendon and the bone. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's going to take a longer time for those people to get their motion back. If we look at an average range of motion recovery following a rotator cuff repair, it's really going to be very variable. Uh, it's going to be all over the place simply because uh, people have a different capacity to deal with pain, and every rotator cuff tear is a little bit different. It's been there for uh, a different period of time and they're in, in different states of preoperative function. So the better function you have preoperatively, the more motion you have, the smaller the tear, the better you're going to recover. Uh, if, however, you are a patient who has a large tear, multiple tendons are involved, poor quality tendon tissue, poor quality bone, somebody who's over 65, it's going to take, take a longer time to recover. If you have impaired function and you can't actively lift the arm prior to surgery, not only will you take a longer time to recover, but in addition to those other risk factors, you have a higher risk of re-tearing. Mm -hmm. There's one other patient population that I think we ought to discuss to, to, to be comprehensive, and that is that patient population that, that a lot of people would consider they have an, a, a tendon tear that is too big to repair. You simply don't have enough tendon material to replace it, put it back where it should be, yeah. and attach it to bone. How do you deal with patients in that category? 
Uh, they're a very tough category of patients. In many of those patients, they are older patients. Uh, some, however, are younger patients. And I think you can treat those two people very differently. Uh, in the group of older patients who may have an irreparable rotator cuff tear, they have several options, but they're not really great options. Some of those people may benefit from therapy and anti-inflammatories if we're choosing for surgery, and if they have pretty good function, they're offered a couple of choices. One is a simple debridement of the joint. If they have an unfixable rotator cuff, you're really not going in and removing any bone spurs, you're not releasing any ligaments, and the reason you don't do that is because they serve a purpose. Those bone spurs are there to stabilize the shoulder. And if you have an older patient who has an unfixable rotator cuff and you take out some of those bone spurs, they may not be able to lift the arm after the surgery. So you can go in and trim and debride arthroscopically some of the tendon or even release the biceps tendon by means of what's called a biceps tenotomy, where you go, just go in and you cut the biceps if it's still intact. And removing the biceps tendon and cleaning up some of the debris can be very helpful. If, on the other hand, those people have a profoundly weak shoulder and they have what's called a pseudo-paralytic shoulder and cannot actively lift the arm and they have a lot of pain with that, another a very good option is what's called a reverse shoulder replacement. Not always the best idea for a younger patient who has that condition, but for older patients it can be a very good way to both relieve pain and restore function because a reverse shoulder replacement is a, it's a, technically a total joint replacement but at the same time it helps to stabilize the joint and gets patients to lift and move the arm by using one of the muscles that still is there and intact. Their rotator cuff may not be operating and functional, but if their deltoid muscle, that outer muscle on the shoulder, if that's functional and working, we can get many of those patients to lift and move the arm again. For a younger patient, however, that's not a reasonable option to do a joint replacement like that on somebody who may be in their uh, 30s, 40s, those are patients who may be a good candidate for a tendon transfer. And that's a very different set of circumstances, a very special group of patients. And fortunately, those patients are few and far between. Well, you know, I think we've, we've pretty much covered the waterfront in terms of the continuum of rotator cuff disease. Mm -hmm. You know, we've covered uh, uh, the impingement process, the tendinosis process that sort of doesn't involve a tendon tear necessarily in the treatment of that and what to expect from that. We've talked a little bit about um, the uh, full rotator cuff and sort of how that's different. And, and the key finding there, I think you said, is that really it's about getting that tendon attached to bone right. and letting it heal. And how that occurs determines what the success rate and in some ways how long this is going to take to recover. Right. Do you have any other um, key points that you think patients need to know about rotator cuff disease of the shoulder uh, and how they should go about making decisions if they're faced with this decision? Well, I, I think you have to have uh, a lot of confidence in your orthopedic surgeon to, to guide you directly uh, and to tell you that this is your condition, this is what I think we can do. And so you have to have a discussion and you have to become educated about what your options are. I think in, in many circumstances we recognize that people expect perfection, don't recognize that sometimes their conditions are so severe that we might be able to improve their shoulder function and not really get them to perfection. I would love to be able to make every patient feel 20 years old again. Reality is we can't do that. So in many cases, what we have to go in with a set of realistic expectations for somebody who may have a small to medium-sized tear and sometimes even an acute large tear, we might be able to get those patients 100% of function. Even if we can't get them all of their motion back, they might be able to do everything they've done before without a lot of impairment, without a lot of pain. It might, it might be far better off than if they let the shoulder, left the shoulder untreated. On the other hand, Patients who have very advanced rotator cuff tears really have to go in, into their surgery with some realistic expectations of either having a debridement of the joint where we're just going to go for pain relief and their function's not going to get any better, but we're going to make them feel better by diminishing the pain, or they're going to have to consider the possibility of that reverse shoulder placement that I discussed with them. Okay. Any downsides or complications of any of these treatments that, that we haven't discussed yet. For example, what are the, the risks of just allowing a rotator cuff tear to 
go untreated. So if I'm a 50-year-old gentleman who has a rotator cuff tear and I, I'm just going to tough it out, right. um, what happens to that patient? Well, there are very few guarantees we can make our patients in terms of surgical outcomes. We can promise that we'll take good care of you and we'll do our best, but when it comes to the eventual outcome of surgery, we can say nine out of ten times you may get this result. On the other hand, we can make promises related to untreated rotator cuff disease. If somebody has a partial tear or a small tear, we can guarantee that will not heal spontaneously. We can also guarantee that a small tear will get bigger and will get worse over time. What we can't predict, however, is how much bigger and how much worse and over how much time. If you're 50 years old, we assume you have a normal life expectancy, you're going to be around for at least 20, 30 more years, and you have a rotator cuff tear now, I can guarantee you it's going to be there next year and it'll be worse over the next several years. You'll eventually get to that point in time where you're going to develop what is called a, a cuff tear arthropathy. Now that may take quite a long time, but the small tear progresses, enlarges, and eventually retracts to the point where it's unfixable. So 10, 15 years from now, you're still healthy and now 60, 65 years old, and you can't lift and move your arm. You've kind of lost that opportunity to fix it when you could, and you're at that point in time where your options are really not that great. And quite honestly, at 60, 65, if you have a cuff tear arthropathy, your options are really just two. You're not a candidate for a tendon transfer. If you have arthritis of the shoulder, it's either leave it and live with it or have that reverse shoulder replacement. And if, if you could have had that cuff tear fixed years before that, I think that would have been your better option. So cuff tears don't heal spontaneously. They don't heal by themselves. Once they're there, because the tendon is attached to the muscle, the tendon retracts once it's torn. It pulls away from its bony attachment. That creates a gap between the bone and the tendon. It doesn't heal without an operation. We can fix it surgically now, but there is a, there's a time frame in which it's done, uh, and we can get you the best result. So it, it sounds like your advice to those patients would be that you're probably better off taking care of that rotator cuff tear early on. Absolutely. Fixing it. Absolutely. To, and it, in some ways that's preventable for, for progressing to these other less treatable yeah, I th conditions. Yeah, I think it's easier to fix, better to fix, and better for your shoulder function going forward to fix it earlier than later. And we're always faced with that working guy who's, who can't take time off from work. It may not be an emergency to do it in the next month or two, but at the same time, it would be ill-advised to tell that patient that they could wait a year or two or more to fix that rotator cuff because, quite honestly, it may not be as easily fixable in the future as it is at that point in time. Well, I think this has been a comprehensive discussion of the state of the art of thinking in terms of rotator cuff disease um, today. So I want to thank you for, for sharing this with us. Thank you. Appreciate it.